I asked them, I said, if it was some younger people in the exact business that you started, and they asked your advice on what should they do to build something similar to what you all have built here, you know, what advice would you give them? And he said, well, I would tell them, you know, do things the right way. You know, treat people right. And he said, I would tell them work. You know, work your tails off, right? And I said, um, you know, in my head, I said, man, we live in a world to where I don't know if, if people appreciate what things produce. In my whole life, the only advantage that I've ever had as a person I've never been the most talented, never been the biggest, the fastest, the strongest, even though I was a four sport athlete my whole life, you know, at the top of every sport that I've ever played, I was never the most talented. I was never the fastest guy, never the strongest guy. I've always been a small guy my whole life. You know, I was that guy I would show up and they knew that I was the guy that played football. They knew behind the jersey I was probably number three or number 29 in college. But when I would show up on the scene, I would always get the reaction, this is the guy because I was small. I didn't even look the part. But the only thing I've always had, my only advantage was, I wasn't afraid of hard work. But most importantly, I knew what I represented. And so by knowing what I represented, my commitment, my dedication, and my, my perfection to my craft and what I represented, it was always on another level. And so now when guys did 10 sprints, I did 30. Because I knew I was working for something greater than myself and what I represented was always greater than myself. And for example, two weeks ago, I was with a kid downtown Atlanta, and I took him downtown, and me and my wife, we have a foundation. It's where we work with homeless shelters. We've adopted three, right? And we work with kids, teenagers, right? We take them, we put them in uncomfortable situations, and we challenge their perspective and their thought process about life. So it was this 15-year-old kid. He had been acting up in school, giving his mom problems. He hadn't seen his father since he was born, basically. And I take him downtown Atlanta and I take him right under a bridge. And so now you got Turner Field, you got where the Falcons play, where the Hawks play, you got the world of Coca-Cola, you got a jail, you got these successful companies, you got people going to work, you know, got the briefcases doing their thing, you got life happening. And then you got under a bridge, you got a gentleman, a grown man, sound asleep, cardboard box, sleeping, as if a person would be in a bed, sleep. And I looked at the kid and I said, do you think he planned to be there? I said, do you think when he got of age at a certain point in his life, do you think he said, man, you know, one day I'll probably be sleeping under a bridge on a cardboard box? The kid said, no. I said, what do you think happened? The kid said, I don't know. What do you think happened? Eh? I said, I think life happened. He said, what do you mean life? I said, I think at a certain point in his life, he was excited, he was Jack, he enjoyed something. He was a part of something special, something had a legacy attached to it, whether it was his family, whether it was a dream, a goal, an aspiration. I think at a certain point, every day he got up, something he represented, he got excited about it, he was driven, he was committed, he was dedicated about it, he was stoked about it, he was jacked about it. But I think at a certain point, life made him forget what he represented. And life stole his joy, his peace, his happiness. Life zipped him up that drive. Life took that dedication, that commitment so much so to the guy that was once driven, to the guy that was once happy and excited about what he was a part of and what he represented and the legacy that was attached to it. That same guy ended up sleeping under a bridge. The only advantage I've ever had, everything I encountered and everything I ever hit in my life, I understood what I represented and life will never take that away from me. And so on September 9, 2006, when I'm eight games away from being a projected first round draft pick and my life changed overnight, something I had been working for since I was seven years old in a park with my mother, watching her sit in an old beat up Buick Regal when she had me at 16 years old. And she took me back to a two bedroom home, 14 people sleeping on the floor with roaches and rats and missing meals when I was a kid. It was times when I went to practice, I hadn't even eaten. And guys would be out there complaining. And the only thing I was working on was my work ethic and my drive and my dream and my goal to get to where I was trying to get to. And I knew if I would have stopped in that moment, I would never get to where I was trying to get to. I would really miss Mills. And I'm working toward this dream and this goal. And I finally get to the point. I can smell it. I can taste it. I can see it. And I'm a part of something. I'm a part of something like a Southern Motion. But it was University of Tennessee. I'm a part of a game to where I got my guys. 
Right? If we go and we work every single day, we show up 5 o'clock in the morning, we're working towards something, we got an element of collective character, we got an element of responsibility, accountability, we got an element, man, when I tell you I got your back, I got your back. When I tell you I care about you, I care about you. When I tell you I love you, I love you. I was a part of something. And I get to the point to where I'm a projected first round draft pick and I go out and I make a tackle. And this is the thing that people don't even know. People know my life changed behind the game of football, but people don't understand the play and how it happened. People don't know that wasn't even my guy. People don't know I had my guy already. I could have easily faded down the sideline, running with my guy as the quarterback was dropping back to release the ball. But as I'm running and checking my guy, I see my teammate getting beat. My guy who I told in the tunnel, hey, man, if you get beat, I got your back. And I knew my teammate probably would have caught the guy if he would have caught the ball because my teammate, he went on to be a first round, 10th pick, multi-million dollar guy, went on to play for the Patriots. So I knew he was a pretty talented guy and he probably would have caught the guy and tackled him. But I told him, hey, man, if you get beat, I got your back. And it just so happened, a play unfolded with a little bit over two minutes left in the game to where my guy, now he was getting beat. And I'm fading off on my guy, but I see the quarterback, he was releasing the ball to the guy that was beating my teammate. And I said, man, I got to go. I got to have his back. And I go up and I roll up and I go to hit this guy to end the game. This tackle probably would have ended the game if I had hit him and caught him. The right way. If I'd have hit him and caught him how I really wanted to catch him, it probably would have ended the game and I would have made him fumble because I knew the game of football like you guys know the furniture business. I knew it in and out. Like a guy take two steps off the line of scrimmage, I could tell you which way he was going. A guy would cut inside, I could tell you it's only about three things he can do out of this formation. Like I knew it in and out. And so I knew if I'd have caught him in the right location at the right time, I'd have popped that ball out. But it didn't work like that. I hit him and as soon as I hit him, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. I lost control of my body. Never happened to me before. Body went completely limp. Seemed as if every breath in my body left. I'm, I'm falling to the ground. Like, man, what's happening? And I black out. As soon as I hit the ground, I black out. Never happened to me before. I black out. I come back to my teammates run over to me. Hey, Ink, get up, man. Let's rock. Let's go. I said, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up. Get up. Let's roll. So I can't move. So there's a shot going from my neck to my toe. I can't feel anything. The shock eventually left and it stayed in my right arm and hand. I remember as I was lying there, they were bringing the spine board out. They put me up on the spine board and as they're willing me off the field, I looked up to the sky and said, surely nothing has happened in this moment that can alter my life. This is what I love to do. They get me over to the ambulance. They said, man, we're gonna take you to the hospital. Run some CAT scans, we'll bring you back into your room, we'll tell you what's up. I said, all right, cool. They take me in the room, they run CAT scans, they bring me back into another room. And when they put me into the room in my hospital bed, my mother comes in, she kisses me, she prays for me, and as she's going to walk out, doctors rush in from the opposite side as my mother is walking out. And when my mother told me, son, you'll be all right, there was a certain element of peace attached to it. Because I have been with my mother my whole life. Me and my father, our relationship was pretty much a business relationship. Early years, he wasn't there. When I started playing sports, he came along in the picture, but I needed him to get out of my situation, right? And so we had a business relationship. But when my mother said something to me, I had been rocking with my mother since I was 16. I had Miss Mills with my mother since, I was, since she was 16, I mean. And so when she said it would be okay, I was like, all right, cool. And as she's going to walk out, doctors running in. They say, hey, guys, get in here. We got to rush him back to surgery. He's about to die. He says, it's a new ball game. Like I was a part of the football game, but this, this is a new game. I said, die. He said, yeah, man, you busted up your clavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. Got to rush you back. Take that main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. You don't have much time. Next morning, I wake up from recovery. He said, Inky, I got some good news and some bad news. Good news, we saved your life. I said, thank you. Bad news is you got nerve damage in your right shoulder. I said, all right, cool. He said, we got to send you up to the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. I said, all right, cool. He said, but the problem is, you know that dream of going to the NFL? I said, yes, sir. I'm close. He said, strong possibility. You probably can never play the game of football another day in your life. I said, no way. I said, um, I, don't, I don't know if you know how hard I work for this. 
Like, I don't know if you know, I've been working since I was seven years old. Like, I didn't start out playing football saying, man, I just want to go to the NFL to make it. Yeah, I want to go to the NFL to take care of my family, give back to my community. But the way in which I started playing a game, I started playing in the street and I would be bloody. My mother didn't even sign me up to play. The first white guy I ever met in my life signed me up to play football. A guy riding down the street in a blue pickup truck. Never forget it. My guy, love him to death. Pulling down the street in a blue pickup truck, pulls on the curb, steps out of his truck, walks up in the middle of our game. I'm standing there bloody, tackling football in the street. Guy walks up, Trey Hurst, never forget it. My uncle's on the corner, they're drug dealers, in prison right now. They take off running. My uncle Bobo serving 40 years in the federal penitentiary. He looks back, he said, Inky, don't talk to him. He thinking the guy's the cop, Coach Trey, nicest guy in the world. Walks up, he said, man, did you kids like to play football on grass? I said, man, I would love that. He said, he said, go in the house and get one of your guardians. I ran in the house. My uncle JJ had married into the family. I said, hey, unk, man, it's a guy outside. Will you please come and talk to him? Uncle said, sure. Uncle comes outside. Coach Trey said, listen. He said, I don't even supposed to be over here. He said, I brought a kid home. His mom asked me, could I bring him home? I brought him home. He said, I rode down the street. I see these kids playing football in the street. They're bloody. He said, you could bring him across town. I got a lead. Y'all can sign him up. I think it would be a great opportunity for him. My uncle said, sir, we greatly appreciate it. Hate to tell you, we don't have the money. And I'm standing in front of him because I really want to play. And he said, I hate to tell you. But his mother he said, she definitely doesn't have the money. She's at work at Wendy's right now. I'll never forget that coach looked at my uncle. He said, I tell you what. He said, y'all bring him to the park. So here's the address. He said, not only will I sign that kid up, he said, I'll sign every kid in the street up and play. They brought us to the park the next day. He signed every last one of us up, and it changed the trajectory of my life. You know, the second person I saw in the hospital after they saved my life, that coach that signed me up to play ball when I was seven years old, crying on my mother's shoulder. You know, the person my mother called on Christmas when me and my family got robbed, they put a 9 millimeter and a 45 in my face when I was 15 years old. That coach that signed me up to play ball when I was seven years old. And so what I was telling the doctor was, Doc, I got to give some people a return on their investment. Like this can't stop right now. And I'll never forget, I said to him, I said, I never cheated. I said, I never cheated. I was taught you work for something, the result will be what you want it to be. Like I never cheated. Like nobody had to worry about me cutting corners. Like a coach could give me a workout, I'll go do it. If my teammate try to cheat, sometimes I'll complete my guy's workout. Like I never, I never, I never believed in it, right? Because I knew every time I cheated, it was a possibility and an opportunity for me to become weaker. And so I never believed in cheating. I never believed in the mentality behind cutting corners and not facing a challenge. Because I understood if it didn't challenge me, it wouldn't change me. I said, man, send me up to the Mayo. My, my career can't be over. I work too hard. And I go up in the Mayo Clinic, and I'll never forget, I walk in the room, and there's three doctors. And they come in, and they say, hey, Inc., here's the deal. We're going to cut to the chase. They said, uh, you have torn all the nerves in your brachial plexus. I said, what's that? They said, it's the nerve roots that go from your spine and controls your shoulder, your arm, and your hand. So it goes into your spine like this. You rip them all out. They can't go back in. They said, we hate to tell you, but football career, it's out of here. So your shoulder, your arm, your hand, never be the same again. They say, here are your surgery options, Inc. We could take a muscle, back of your left leg, plug it into your right arm, possibility, weak left leg, weak right arm the rest of your life. We could take a nerve out of your left arm, reroute it up to your chest, down to your right arm, possibility, two weak arms the rest of your life. We could take a nerve out of your left rib, reroute it up to your chest, down to your right arm, possibility, breathing problem, weak right arm the rest of your life. By the way, tell us what you want to do at 8 o'clock in the morning. Next morning, I walked into the office. They said, what option did you choose? I said, no disrespect to you. Cut me where you got to cut me. I guarantee you, if I don't die, I'll be fine. They said, you got to choose an option. I said, no disrespect to you. Cut me where you got to cut me. I guarantee you, if I don't die, I'll be fine. And what I was telling them was, Doc, you got to take my life before you take my drive, man. I'm not a light switch person. Like, I don't turn it on and turn it. Like, I can play you in checkers. I'm going to try to destroy you. Like, I can play you in a game of, you know, little pitch and hold, a little thing. I'm going to try to destroy you. 
That's just my mentality of just going all in and everything that I do. And what I was telling him, you can cut me wherever you got to cut me. If you don't kill me, you will not stop me because I know my mentality and I know the way I'm wired. I don't turn it on and turn it off. But as life would have it, they cut me six times down my left eye. One time across the left side of my neck, one time across the right side, twice to my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit, bottom of my hand. 350 staples in my body banished me from my neck to my knees. And they come in my room the next day. They said, Inky, we're going to get to know each other really well. You've been in this hospital the next 40 or 60 days. On the third day, we were leaving the hospital. And as we're leaving and the doors were opening, he said, you broke a record. How did you do it? He said, nobody has ever gotten out of here in under less than 40 days with a surgery of that magnitude. I said, uh... Doc, I just didn't feel as if I had the right. So what are you talking about, had the right? I said, um, I just didn't feel as if I had the right to stop. Like, I, I just didn't feel as if I had the right not to show up and give everything up. Like, I just didn't feel as if I had the right to not press forward. Like, I just felt as if the people that I represent and the people that had invested in me and built the, the, the gentleman that you see called Inky, it's a lot of people that go into the, like, when they were out there telling me, man, I admire what you've been through. I admire the place you've gotten to in life. And I told them, I said, there was a lot of people that helped me. And I take those spirits with me every day. Like, uh, Maya Angelou has a quote that says, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Meaning I had made a vow to a lot of people. I had made vows to a lot of people about what I would do and what I would represent. And when I tell somebody something, I don't take that lightly. Like if I told you I'm going to give you everything I got, you can bet your bottom dollar I'm going to give you everything I got. If we're walking somewhere and we end up in an alley and 10 people come in the alley and they're trying to rob us and I tell you, hey brother, we're getting home, we're getting home. And I'm not running. My word. It means something and whatever I got to go through and accept and be a part of in order to make it happen, I'm willing to go through. I'm committed to every single aspect of my life. And I was taught commitment is staying true to what you said you would do long after the mood that you said it in has left. Because we say things when the mood is right, right? But when the environment and the mood changes, we, we back off. Of it. But I have made a vow to a lot of people, not only my teammates, I made a vow to everybody that had ever invested in me in my life that I would finish what I started and I would complete my mission every single day. And by completing my mission in life every single day, I mean I will empty my bucket and give every aspect of my life every single bit of Inky Johnson. I may be crazy, I don't know, but I just believe my five-year-old son and my six-year-old daughter, they deserve the best version of me. I may be crazy, I don't know, but I just believe my wife that I've been with ever since we were in the fifth grade, she deserved the best version of me. I may be crazy, I don't know, but my three little sisters, I just believe they deserve the best version of their big brother. I may be crazy, I don't know, but the people I'm of service to on this face of this planet, they deserve the best version of me, and I'm not going to give them any less. See, the thing I understand about business, I might not know more, more much about the furniture business, but I know a lot about the people's business. And I know every single day, the people that come across our paths, whether we're doing business with them, whether we're talking to them about any aspect of life, I know they're coming across our path for a reason. And I'm going to try my best to leave them a little bit different. The only reason I kept pressing forward, the only reason I didn't stop was because everybody that I met and everybody I came across, I knew they were looking at my perspective about life. And if I can keep pressing forward, they may encounter something that they may face and they want to stop. And the first person that will pop up in their mind, man, if ink pressed forward and ink kept going, surely I can do it. And so the next week I was back at practice with my teammates, my guys that I work with, my guys that we went through the struggle with, my guys that we cracked jokes with, my guys we got knocked out with, my guys that we went to war with, my guys that I would give everything for them. I was back at practice in the sand pit with a Dunjoy sling and I still had my staples in my body. I was back in class the next week, got my undergrad degree in three years when my life changed overnight. I never stopped. I never missed a beat and my life changed. And people ask me all the time, how did you keep pressing forward? Like the video that you all saw, I want to give you the backdrop to how it happened. ESPN called me. They did a story on me this past summer. But they called me one day, and I picked up the phone. They said, is this Inky Johnson? I said, last time I checked, I'm Inky Johnson. <laughs> they said, is this the same guy that said, if you could change what happened to you, you wouldn't? I said, absolutely. They said, it's our understanding the game of football meant the world to you. I said, at one point, it did. It said, it's our understanding that your family was banking on you making it to the NFL so they can have a better way of life. I said, yep, yeah, that's, that's correct. They said, we're coming to see you. I said, all right, cool, come on. They said, but we don't want to see you in Atlanta. We want to see you in Neyland Stadium on the exact yard line where your life changed. The same time of day. The only thing that won't be present is Air Force's team. I said, all right, cool. 
And so they take me to Neyland Stadium. They put me on the exact yard line with my life changed. They said, now tell your younger self why you wouldn't stop your injury if you could. If you could be in the NFL right now making millions of dollars, tell your younger self why you wouldn't change that situation if you could. And I say the reason I wouldn't change it, believe it or not, it has nothing to do with me. Like on a personal level, you, he thought I was going to say because of the man that I've become, the perspective that I've acquired, my faith has been fortified. He thought I was going to say something like that. I said, no, it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the lives that have been affected by the result of the process and the thing that I represent in the world. What my spirit represents when somebody see me, they think perseverance. What my spirit represents when somebody see me, they think don't quit. What my spirit represents when somebody see me, they think it's a, it's a, it's, that's a quality individual right there. What my character represents in the world. And every single day we're putting something out like that represents something. When people see that, they think it's a thought that comes to the mind. When he said gold standard, he gave me that. I felt a certain type of way. When he gave me the gold standard, I felt a certain type. I felt different. Gold standard. I, I, I felt like that went with me. Because I think in what I do, the line of business I'm in, I'm the gold standard. Because I don't compromise. And every single day, I'm going to give you my very best. You can bet your bottom dollar. Every single day, I'm going to bring that gold standard to life. And I'm not just bringing it in one aspect of life. I'm bringing it in every single aspect of life. I'm not going to be one of these people in the world that's a public success, but they're a private failure. I mean, they give everything they got to one aspect of life, but the other areas, they lack off. No, I'm going to give every single thing I got to every aspect of my life because I represent something. When people see me, they think something. Whether that's character, never giving up, never surrendering. And the thing that we can never do is forget what we represent. Because that's how guys end up on the bridge on a cardboard box sleep. They forget what they represent when life hits them with adversity. My only charge for you, never forget what you represent. Life is short. Let's enjoy it while we got it. Ha baby, se na ni lately Shkundi mu i su pom, edhe dhe i treti Sanet po ndrojnë të mund nuk o një njeti Fajo shtë jam, jam a jo bashi keti